I would like to welcome you all to this event. Being a department chair has many pleasures, but uh, probably the greatest pleasure is to kick off the Van Horn Lectures. And an even greater pleasure is to kick off Van Horn Lectures with an old friend that, uh, who I haven't seen in a while, uh, but uh, we have met occasionally over the past decades after sharing a prolonged time back in Stuttgart. And so I'm very happy to have Professor Wayne Kaplan here today and to introduce his Van Horn lectures. But my role here is actually to let you know a little bit about the Van Horn lecture series and what it is about. So the name Van Horn is omnipresent in our department and also can be seen on campus in some locations where you may not even expect it, like next to the Van Horn Field, which is our sports field next to the Wheeled Center. And uh, it confused me in the beginning, but thanks to what I learned from Professor Corley in, on various previous occasions, I now see this a little clearer. The secret to understanding is, is that there are two Van Horns. So there's Frank Van Horn, who was a professor here in the very early days of this school. And uh, he was actually a mineralogist and uh, also very well known for his activities in sports. He was known as the Count, not for counting something, but in the sense of Count like Duke. I guess this has to do with the name Van Horn, which is actually of Dutch origin and uh, could be a name of a duke, I don't, I don't know. That's just speculation. This is so long ago, it goes back to 1880. And uh, <clears throat> Frank van Horn was married to Myra van Horn, and their son was Kent van Horn, who actually was an undergraduate at the case. And uh, his interest was in what we now call physical metallurgy. And he went on from here to obtain a master's and a PhD degree at Yale. Uh, he graduated here in the late 1920s, I think, and then went on, returned, and worked for Alcoa. <clears throat> and after some time, he moved on, I believe, to Pittsburgh and became the head of one of the first research and development branches of a company, Alcoa in this case, and uh, was in charge of their research and development for a prolonged time, and that left a very remarkable track in the literature as well. Ken van Horn is responsible for our van Horn library, where you can also see a, a picture of him, and is also behind the endowment that we have for this Van Horn lecture series, which enables us to get very well-known researchers like Wayne from various places all over the world. And this actually started already in 1974, and Maybe one time that was skipped over one year. Anyways, Wayne is now the 40th Van Horn lecturer. So that's a, a big anniversary in this series. And if you look at the names that are shown on the plaques that you can see in our Van Horn library, these are little brass plaques. I hope you have seen yours there. I did, yes. That reads like the who is who in material science. Um, and it is certainly a very uh, distinct club in which you are now introduced to And at this point, I would like to hand over to Arthur, who will introduce Wayne. Well, thank you, Frank, and thank you for the opportunity to introduce, again, a very old friend. Uh, he's. Um, quite young compared to me, but we, I've known him since he was just about uh, finishing his PhD. Um, he's 
uh, you'll hear from his accent that he's an American by birth, but emigrated to uh, Israel as a college student and uh, did all of his degrees at the Technion, uh, ending with a PhD in 1994 with the well-known uh, material scientist David Brandon as his supervisor. He then spent a year in Stuttgart as a postdoc with Matthew Ruler, who again a van, previous Van Horn lecturer, and uh, then joined the faculty at the Technion and has been there now since 1995, a total of 21 years. Um, he is a remarkable scholar, as you'll hear from a lecture which I can promise you will be filled with erudition. Every time I've heard Wayne talk, I've learned something which I thought I should have known, uh, or if I knew, I knew it better after hearing him talk. His research, uh, he's had a remarkable career, in my opinion, at the Technion. Um, he has, as far as his scholarship is concerned, we checked his H index is 28 for a man of his uh, youthful appearance and youthful age. That's really quite an achievement. I didn't count up all the number of papers he had, but it's considerable to have an H index of that uh, magnitude. Um, I got to know Wayne uh, particularly well in 2012, where I had the very great good fortune to be asked to give a series of lectures similar to our Van Horn lectures at the Technion, named for another well-known material scientist, David Seidman. And in that period, I spent a week at the Technion, and I marveled at several things. At the time, Wayne was dean of the Department of Material Science and Engineering. It's a department roughly twice the size of ours. And the title dean, we would just be a department a head or a chair, but at the Technion, it's called a dean. And, um, and not only was he the dean that has had all the responsibility for this quite large department with 17 or 18 faculty and large undergraduate and graduate uh, populations of students, but he also uh, ran the characterization center, which is very impressive. He did, and he seemed to do this with great ease. Ran the department. Um, it was a period of great excitement. I happened to be there the week after Denny Schechtman, one of his faculty, received the Nobel Prize in uh, Stockholm for the discovery of um, quasi-crystals. And uh, Wayne, uh, I'm sure, had to deal with a very large ego uh, by my friend Danny Sheckman. Um, when he gave up the deanship after uh, five years or so, uh, just to return to the teaching ranks, his administrative abilities were recognized and uh, the president of Technion twisted his arm, so he's now the executive vice president for research as well as running the characterization facility in the department, as well as teaching and doing research students, I don't know how many PhD students he has had over the years. One in particular I'm particularly fond of, Amir Avishai, whom you all know, who is the uh, administrative director of the Swage Lock Center and was one of Wayne's students. And if any of you have worked with Wayne, uh, with Amir, you'll know what a terrific mentor and teacher and uh, he was uh, just from the wonderful uh, performance Samir has um, generated since he joined our group 10 years ago or so? 12 years. All right. Um, Wayne has one other distinction. Uh, in addition to me, he's the only other um, scientist I know who believes our deity is female, as you'll see at the bottom of uh, uh, his slide. So with that uh, quite uh, feminist attitude, it's a great happiness to turn the lecture over to you, Wayne. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur um, and, and Frank. And, uh, and it's, uh, I'm really excited to be here. This is uh, really an honor. I have to admit, uh, when I first got the kind letter, I looked at uh, the published list of past recipients, and I was a little bit scared. Um, I realize that uh, this is a lecture series that uh, has got to stand up to par, and it's, a, it's an exciting challenge, um, which uh, I'm looking forward to. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. It's my first time at Case. Uh, so it's a unique opportunity, a double pleasure for me to get to know 
uh, people that I haven't met, to meet up with people that I do know, and to, uh, and to do this lecture series. So I think I'll start. Um, I was asked to give three talks, and the first talk, as it's written here, is actually for undergraduate students. That was what I was asked to do. Um, I'm going to talk about wedding. I'm an interface guy, a surface guy. Um, and I'm a little bit schizophrenic here because I'm stuck between thermodynamics and atomistics. And of course, bringing them together is always a challenge. Um, and that's what we've been doing for the last few years. And so uh, the goal of my talk is to touch on these, or the goal of this week for me is to touch on these aspects in the next two talks. And in this talk, to raise some of the uh, critical issues that I think are important uh, in order to understand the rest of the week. Um, a lot of it's going to be uh, terminology, and I'm a stickler on terminology, um, and I just want to make it sure that, I, that you guys understand what I'm trying to say. One last point before I begin, uh, I'm from the Technion, and uh, if you know Amir, then you know that uh, Israelis are uh, full of something we call chutzpah. Um, that means that when you give a lecture, uh, there's no such thing as waiting to the end for questions, um, and sometimes also not waiting to the end for arguments. Um, <laughs> And it won't phase me at all if you, if you jump up and say, hey, that's not right, or what do you mean? I don't understand. So feel free. I'll feel better if you do it. I'll feel almost at home. <laughs> um, and as far as uh, God being a woman, um, I'm more than willing to go into the, uh, uh, the logistic proof of that. Uh, <laughs> and there is one uh, <laughs> at the end of the lecture, though. I won't do that right now. <laughs> Um, before I begin on wedding, um, I figure I, I, I day, for those of you who haven't been to Israel or don't even know where it is, it's this tiny little country, and I figured I'd give two slides just showing where the Technion is. So this is a map of Israel. Um, a, a Jerusalem's about here. Um, some statistics, a, it's, it's really small. Basically, it's a, it's a city uh, here in the United States. You can tell by the population. Uh, the Technion is located in the north, uh, right here uh, in Haifa, city of Haifa, which is on the Carmel Mountain, a name that here in the U.S. is used, Carmel, a lot. It basically means the uh, vineyards of God, uh, Carmel, right? Carmel. Um, and uh, the Technion itself is the oldest university in Israel. It was actually founded before the beginning of modern Israel in 1912. There were some disturbances when they first started the university, uh, basically called World War I, so it took a little bit while to get going. Uh, today we have 18 departments, although uh, for some reason people in Israel and the Technion still call them faculties, but they're really departments, um, only focusing on science and engineering. All the fundamental science and, and most of the engineering. And then we have uh, two kind of weird ones. Uh, one is the medical school. Uh, uh, and I say it's weird because my wife is there part-time, so I get to tease her that way. Actually, my son is there now full-time, so I get to tease him as well. And the other is uh, architecture, which is not really normal for an engineering university. But if you think about it, it makes kind of sense. Um, we've had uh, some sex in uh, educating students in some research. I think the Technion is more known for its uh, translation of technology to industry. Um, uh, and more recently, two uh, what I call international uh, co connections. One is a partnership with Cornell, uh, where we have founded a small uh, campus in New York, and the other is in, in China. Anyway, that's enough from uh, the Technion from where I'm coming from. I'd like to, let's start. And what I'm going to do today uh, is actually, this is the list. So we'll talk about uh, surface energy, uh, a little bit about why it's important and try to get a good feel of what it is. Um, I'll go into some of the more general concepts, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And for those of you who are, uh, deeply uh, understand this stuff, I apologize. Uh, but I will go into it, including even Young's equation, or why that's wrong, um, uh, how we can, can uh, besides that, address quantitative measurements of interface energy, surface energy, et cetera. And then uh, I'm going to deal with Kahn's wedding point transition, critical wedding point transition. This is John Kahn who died uh, last week. Uh, John Kahn who was on the paper about quasi-crystals, uh, the John Kahn. Um, and uh, I'm going to use John's critical point wedding transition to go into uh, adsorption 
and some of the issues that have been raised lately, and this will help later on this week. So surface energy is a, should be fairly, fairly obvious for most of us. Uh, from a thermodynamic point of view, there's a lot of different ways to explain this. Uh, I, I've just selected one, and that's a simple bubble uh, where we can talk about an, a specific uh, energy of a surface, joules per meter squared. Um, and we can talk about that in terms of uh, the specific energy multiplied by the total area of the surface. Um, and if we were to imagine a bubble uh, that has a specific surface energy, and we're going to try to shrink that down, as we shrink it, uh, we're going to generate a pressure differenti differential, uh, delta P, because we're now confining or reducing this volume, the same amount of molecules inside of it. And of course, that's going to balance any reduction of surface energy that we uh, obtain because we've reduced the total area, right? We've made the bubble smaller, there's less area, and the total surface energy is the specific su surface energy gamma times the surface area itself. So that simple balance, which is just written here, and I'm sure all of you have seen this, uh, immediately just gives you the Laplace equation, which is this connection between uh, the pressure differential, um, the surface energy gamma, and the radius of curvature. Of course, life is not simple with uh, 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 bubbles. Uh, we often have more complex shape, and we actually need two radii of curvature in order to describe this correctly, um, but that's not a problem. That's uh, in the details. So this is the surface energy, and it's a way to think about uh, the importance of surface energy in a, in a simple change. But where does it really come from? I mean, surface energy itself. And the way that I like to think about it is the concept of atoms at a surface who are no longer in an environment that they're happy with. Um, so uh, we can uh, think of a, a student or one of you sitting in the middle of the audience. You have your friends and colleagues around you, and you're feeling quite comfortable. Uh, and then there's poor Amir, who's sitting out here on the edge. He only has Arthur next to him, and he doesn't have a lot of friends around him. <laughs> okay? So Amir, Amir is in an energy state, which is much significantly higher than, than uh, one of you that's in the middle and have people around you. Um, and this is a way that I like to think about surface energy. We have atoms on a surface, who would much, this is a surface of sapphire, which would much prefer to be in the bulk itself, where all their bond, we can think of it as chemical bonds, those who want to think of it that way, are satisfied, um, or the minimum, the, the, this, the environment is minimized as far as energy. Um, so, I expect that this little aluminum guy is not happy compared to this aluminum guy down in the bulk. So this is the excess energy or the specific surface energy um, related to the surface. And the system is going to do everything it can to minimize that because it wants to be uh, at minimum energy state. And that's important for a lot of processes that we all know and love and sometimes hate. Um, and I'm going to put up two. One is densification, and the other is grain growth, both driven by minimization of surface energy. Here I have to be careful. I say surface, and you'll find me uh, replacing surface and grain, and grain boundaries and interfaces all the time, because they are the same. The, uh, an internal surface, a grain boundary or an interface, is exactly the same as a surface of, and the free surface of a, of, a, of a substance, because that actually it's not a free surface, really. It's in contact with the gas uh, or with a vacuum that has a partial pressure of gases. Um, so these are all surfaces for me. In any case, uh, if we look at the total energy, uh, that's gamma times A, and the system's going to want to minimize this uh, in any way it can. And if we're talking about a, a, a powder compact, one way to minimize it is to replace the free surface by grain boundaries. We all expect that atoms that are uh, uh, at a free surface, uh, if they have atoms across the boundary to connect with, they will be at a lower energy state than at the free surface itself. Maybe not as low as in the middle of the crystal where their friends are around them and everything is perfect, uh, but it's certainly lower energy than the free surface. So you have a driving force for basically sintering. We're replacing surface surfaces with grain boundaries. That's pretty simple. The other one, and which is a competing process here, uh, is uh, the change in area itself. So here, we're, I'm talking about grain growth, or I've driven, drawn this out as particle growth, but we have uh, a reduction in surface area because the particles are now larger and there are fewer of them. Uh, or if it's grain growth, 
uh, then we're eradicating grain boundaries and our grains are larger. In any case, we're reducing the total surface area of the surface. The surfaces are staying the same in general, um, and that's this coarsening process. So it's this unique balance between them which uh, is really, really important. Actually, I learned this lesson the hard way uh, by trying to revisit the problem of sintering silicon carbide. Um, and there's this age-old question about why you have to add carbon and boron, an argument in the literature for a long time. And we decided to play with this in the TM and try to figure this out. And, and of course, uh, the problem with silicon carbide is that the surface oxidizes, and you get silicon oxide. And silicon oxide has an extremely low surface energy, certainly lower than that of silicon carbide. So while the system wants to reduce the surface energy by oxidizing, it's a bulk oxidation actually, so it's not really just surface, it kills the driving force for sintering. So the trick is, of course, to reduce that, reduce the silicon oxide. Uh, and that's the role of carbon and partially that of boron. So these are, these are important concepts. Surfaces are also extremely anisotropic in energy in real materials. And I hope you can see this from where you're sitting. I'm a little bit too close. But this is a, a single crystal of nickel. We actually formed this by doing a process called de-wetting. I'll talk about that a little bit later this week. Um, de-wetting is jargon, I apologize. Uh, the simple concept is that of a thin film, and we all know that thin films are intrinsically unstable always. So uh, those working in microelectronics or using computers should be really afraid because eventually our thin films will break up into individual particles, uh, and of course those devices will fail. Um, and in this case, we use this process to reach equilibrium, and now we have a single crystal, in this case of nickel, sitting on, by chance, the basal plane of sapphire. Um, and I hope you can see from the SEM, this is from the top, a plan view, this is inclined, there are these surface facets. And these facets are just parallel to specific crystallographic planes which have relatively low surface energy. The systems want to, will want to be parallel to these planes in order to minimize the surface energy. Um, by the way, nickel is incredibly anisotropic. Uh, most crystal, uh, equilibrium crystal shapes are not so heavily faceted as you see here. So it's not really fair to show nickel, um, but uh, uh, it's a challenging experiment because it's so anisotropic. The way to describe this more fully or comprehensively is, of course, with the Wolf plot, uh, which in this case is just a two-dimensional diagram showing uh, the surface energy uh, in red as a function of orientation or crystallographic plane. So the y is 0, 1, 0. The x direction is 1, 0, 0. And this red line is just the surface energy that we would have uh, if we had a surface uh, perpendicular to this. And we can actually, uh, from the Wolf plot, if we were to have that, we could work out the equilibrium crystal shape or the minimum, crystal, uh, minimum energy crystal shape uh, simply by going out from the center of the Wolf plot to a specific point and drawing a perpendicular. And the uh, volume, in this case the area, which is defined by these perpendicular lines, there's one right here, there's another one that's coming off here, is this well weird shape in this kind of hypothetical example, which would be the equilibrium crystal shape. So at equilibrium, this is the shape that should minimize total surface energy. By the way, this is a macroscopic, uh, if I may diverge, macroscopic point of view. It completely ignores the microscopic degrees of freedom, okay? which are not unimportant. They're actually critical. Microscopic degrees of freedom uh, here would be surface reconstruction, adsorption, et cetera, anything that would alter a specific surface plane. In any case, uh, we can get at this from a Wolf plot, uh, or we can take a surface, uh, a crystal that's at equilibrium, and try to pull out the Wolf shape from this uh, for future use. So this is the case of anisotropy, and it's the normal case. If we talk about surface energy, um, I think it's better to be isotropic for a moment. And we can go back to the classic example that is taught in high school, and we put of a Cecil drop, okay? Um, and here, uh, it's a really nice example because it's a beautiful system where we have a drop. At equilibrium, there should be some contact angle, uh, which is the Young's contact angle, uh, refle which reflects the relative surface and interface energies of this specific system. By the way, Young's angle is completely uh, independent from gravity. Uh, has no effect on, gravity has no effect on the contact angle itself. Um, but it does have an effect on the shape of the droplet, 
which is a nice way to get out the absolute value of surface energies of liquids. And that's one of the usual ways to do so. In any case, Young's equation itself basically describes this minimization of surface and interface energies. And that's what's written here. So we have the surface energy uh, of the soli solid balanced by the solid liquid interface energy and by the component of the uh, surface energy of the liquid, or gamma liquid vapor, times cosine of, of the contact angle. Um, yeah? So I got a question. Are you serious about the interruption? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the previous slide, you mentioned equilibrium. And on this slide, you mentioned equilibrium. Yeah. Can you comment on how do you know that nickel is at equilibrium? Oh, um, well, the, uh, it's a good question. It's a hard one. Um, the best we can do is to cook it forever and, and see if it changes. That's an experimentalist point of view. There's another way, and that is to look at um, the surface diffusion mechanisms and the length scales of time for um, the, the length scale of the particle that we're talking about. Um, and that's why we actually need to do this in the SEM or the TEM, uh, because in order to be in uh, length time scales that are of some possibility in experiments, then, we, then these are pretty small particles. Um, so uh, I think uh, for nickel of a particle of about uh, 150 to 200 nanometers, uh, something like six hours with the surface diffusiv diffusivity at 1,200 degrees, uh, uh, assuming that there's at least one uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, screw dislocation around in the area, uh, should easily be accessible. Um, so what we do is we, we calculate that, and then we just double it and wait a little bit longer. So that's the equilibrium. As far as here, this is definitely not an equilibrium. Okay, This is wrong, and I'll get that, to that in a minute. But we, we all learn that this is correct, so let's stay with that for a moment. So we have, we have this balance. And if you think of the uh, surface energies here as normalized uh, forces, and if you look at the units, joules per meter squared or newton per meter, that's uh, certainly uh, kosher, uh, then this is an energy balance, or not, sorry, a force balance in the horizontal direction, okay? Uh, which means that actually we should have a force balance in the vertical direction as well. And that's not written down here at all. And that's why Young's equation often is misleading. I'll get to that in a minute. In addition to Young's equation, we have this equation of the thermodynamic work of adhesion, which is from a guy named Dupree. And it's basically um, saying that we're going to look at the surface energy of the liquid and the surface energy of the solid. And now we're going to bring them together and make an interface, which is here. And this energy difference is the gain or the, the payment that we have to make in order to generate that interface. Okay? Please be careful. This is the surface energy of the solid at equilibrium, the surface energy of the liquid at equilibrium, and the interface afterwards at equilibrium. That's not what we measure if we were to ideally, without a, some plastic deformation process, separate this droplet from the liquid. Because we would then measure the energy of separation. Some call this the work of separation, uh, which would not include the drop down to low energy uh, state of the surface. And that can be significant. It can really be significant. And that's where Thermodynamics people who do wetting and uh, people who do fracture sometimes don't communicate properly. And there can be misunderstandings. That's why that's written here. Anyway, you can combine these together, and uh, suddenly you have an equation uh, that's of some use. Because this is one equation with two unknowns. We can get at the contact angle. We can get at the surface energy of the liquid. But the surface energy of the solid, we almost never know. Almost never. Even, sorry, I apologize, I have to do this. Even if you're doing polymers, you don't know the surface energy of your solid. Okay? Sometimes we guesstimate this, and we calculate the surface energy. Um, but I'm willing to bet that uh, there's some significant problems there. So anyway, it's, a, it's one equation, two unknowns. Here, here, we're just looking at an experimental contact angle, an experimental energy of the surface of the liquid, and we can get out the thermodynamic work of adhesion. And that's a value that we can go and can compare between system to system. As long as we, don't, as we remember that it is not the thermodynamic work of adhesion, after that little drop solidifies. So if you're trying to get at, I don't know, some kind of composite, for example, between a metal and a ceramic, and you're looking at a contact angle of the metal liquid droplet on the, on the solid, and we were to solidify it, 
then I promise you that the thermodynamic work of adhesion is going to be different after it solidifies. Unfortunately, um, people sometimes forget that. So why is Young's equation not correct, or why does it bother me? Actually, the limitation is that it's correct as long as the interface is flat and coplanar with that of the surface. Why do I say that? Because if we were to really reach equilibrium, at least at the triple uh, lines, what you would get here is a small ridge, and adjacent to it, a small trough. Actually, we've shown this experimentally several times. Uh, not only we, several people, uh, by se sectioning small droplets in half. And actually, actually, here's a nice little example where you can see the ridge without even touching the, uh, the particle. But if you were to section that in half, you'll see a small trough adjacent to the ridge. And actually, this is just the Mullins equation. This is grain boundary grooving. Exactly that rotated 90 degrees. So the, the question is, what do we do here? Uh, when is Young's qua equation valid? Um, it's a problem. So the real answer is, well, uh, we don't know if we're really, we, technically we'll never be in equilibrium until this trough expands and we get a lenticular shape underneath it, right? Lenticular within the limits of the anisotropy of the solid. Um, but, but that implies that there's some reactivity. No, no, let's imagine two immiscible systems. All it is is capillary driven transport. We could have reactivity, but let's imagine for a moment that there isn't. Let's stay simple. Um, all we have is capillary driven transport. Minimization of surface uh, interface energy in this case. Um, so, so technically what we need to do every time is to uh, get rid of the liquid, look underneath it, look at the shape, and look at the real contact angles and try to deal with them quantitatively. Or say, OK, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look at a drop of water on a piece of glass, and I'm going to measure within five minutes. And I'm going to be honest with myself, and I won't call this an equilibrium contact angle. But the five minutes is going to be relevant for whatever process that I'm interested in. And if I want to do a comparison in that way, that's almost kosher. How can we do this uh, really? Well, here's an example, uh, again, isotropic and only liquids. Uh, so we have a vapor phase, we have a yellow liquid, and we have this gray liquid down here. And if we reach equilibrium, we'd have this lenticular shape. Um, and now I can define the three dihedral angles that are formed. And I can look at the interface energies, and I can write the von, Lu von Neumann equation, uh, uh, or the sine equation, some people call this. And if I know one surface energy, then I can work my way around and work out all the other uh, surface energies of the system. This, this is fine. This is fine. It works for the isotropic case for liquids. And it's really, really important. There's a lot of work on liquids that that's really useful for. We get stuck on solids, because solids, as I said before, are not isotropic. And the correct way to write the energy balance at a grain boundary, for example, is the Herring equation, which is written down here which is this balance of surface energies, gamma, and t is just the vector defining, basically defining uh, the, the surface. But there's also this component called the torque, which is the derivative of the surface energy with angle. Actually, if I, I found this problem with, for students. When they read about torque the first time, it can be kind of confusing. And uh, of course, the best way to f figure this out is to get a student to explain it. And the best explanation I ever heard and by the way, this is from Hila, was uh, this is the um, torque is the, well, think of it as a force for a moment, pulling the surface to be oriented with the minimum energy that's possible. And that's exactly what it is, because if it's the derivative, it'll be a dip on the surface uh, energy plot. So you have to add this for solids. And there's always a torque term for solids, always. Um, and that's why uh, when you do a grain boundary groove analysis and you look at the grain boundary angle, the, uh, the grooving angle here, the problem is that normally you're going to have these facets. Once you have these facets here, th that's the degree of anisotropy, then you have to take in these torque terms. And then uh, the classic uh, uh, dihedral angle measurement is, 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 is wrong. It's worse than that because often we do this by AFM. And we never really know the orientation of the grain boundary anyway. So the angle is an apparent angle, and it's not the true angle. 
Of course, there's a way around this. Just lop that sucker in half with your fib, right? And go in and look at the exact angles and do dihedral angle analysis and just ignore the torque because that's the best you can do, right? Yeah? I'm sorry, I missed what your small t represents. It's the uh, vector, it's a unit vector, which simply defines the uh, parallel to the surface. Or here's the normal. So that's the, it's just defining, a vector defining the surface itself. So you have uh, the grain boundary and its energy. You have this surface and its energy, and this surface and this energy. And then with the three di dihedral angles, you come back to the von Neumann equation that we talked about before. And your uh, surface energy is a scalar? Uh, the gamma is a scalar? Yeah. <laughs> um, I here it is. Yeah. Yeah. Here it is. Um, I it's anisotropic. Of course, we don't talk about a I, I, I haven't said the word, uh, I've only said surface energy, right? I have not used another term uh, called surface tension. For liquids, and for liquids, surface energy and surface tension are the same. Uh, for solids, they're not. But here, there's a whole slew of definition problems, and I really don't want to get into it right now. But I'm willing to do that later, if you have more questions about it. What I want to do is, is this, is, is to move away from this isotropic case and talk about anisotropic case. How can we get around this? Measuring interface energies between anisotropic systems, which are really more important for us. And I'll start by showing the way that we can't do it, and we can't measure contact angles, OK? There are papers about this. Uh, it's really important, and I, I put up a very simple geometrical example uh, to, exp to prove this. So let's say we have a solid, our yellow solid, and it's going to be brought to equilibrium with this gray substrate, OK? And what I've, you can see we have the equilibrium crystal shape. This is part of the equilibrium crystal shape of the solid, OK? And I've drawn the contact angle, OK? Now I'm going to add uh, some material that will only go to the interface. It's red, this material. Its presence reduces the interface energy. The presence of the red at the interface reduces the interface energy. And therefore, the system wants to increase the area of the interface at the expense of the free surfaces, right? So now we have a much larger area of contact than we did before. The only thing that I've done here in this thought experiment is reduce the interface energy itself. That's it, OK? But you will notice immediately that the equilibrium crystal shape of the solid hasn't changed. We've just truncated it at a different point. Right? And therefore, the contact angle also doesn't change. So you can't use the contact angles for solids like you can with liquids. OK? Very simple uh, proof, which can be done much more elegantly mathematically. There's a way around this. It wasn't really useful until we got more advanced electron microscopy techniques. And it's a technique by a guy named Winterbottom, uh, who wrote this up uh, in the late 60s. And then it was ripped apart by John Kahn uh, uh, and proven to be correct by him because it includes the torque terms. That's the nice part. There's a caveat to this. There's a, uh, a, uh, a Bulgarian who wrote a paper at the same time uh, in Russian uh, the same year, uh, apparently independently. And I can't remember his name right now, but I have it written down. And some of my Russian friends get very uh, up, upset when I call this the winter bottom equation, and I should be calling it after this guy, this uh, other guy. But I, I'm willing to give credit to whoever, because it's the important part is that we have a way to get at these interface energies. And basically, I'm not going to go through the entire uh, development. You can read it in Winterbottom's paper. Um, we're talking about a, the convolution of two equilibrium crystal shapes, that of the solid and that of the liquid where we minimize surface and interface er er uh, energy. That's it. At the end, for this example on the right, where this effective contact angle is quite large, um, we have this equation where the ratio between the distance from the center of the wolf point to the interface, R1, and the distance to any of these facets, in this case I took R2, but it could be uh, out here as well, it re reflects the relative surface and interface energies of the system. OK? So we get a relative value. That's all we can get out of this. Unless we know, let's say, the surface energy of the particle and that of the substrate. And then we can actually get at the absolute interface energy itself. 
Um, I separate this artificially into two different regimes, a contact angle, effective contact angle, uh, greater than 90 degrees and one that's less than 90 degrees. There's no meaning to 90 degrees uh, contact angles, even for liquids, at all. Uh, the only reason I separate them because when the contact angle, the effective contact angle is less than 90 degrees, then all we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. And we have to guess where the wolf point is, the center of the wolf, of the, of the yellow one. Here I see it. I can identify it. Here I have to guess, and I get a little bit scared when I do that, because uh, that's a measurement that we're not always 100% confident in. But if you have no other choice, you can also deal with that and try to get out the interface energy. Uh, we have to wait for these guys to equilibrate. They have to be pretty small, and we have to be able to lop them right in the middle. And there's no way you can do that with a diamond saw, but you guys have a dual beam. You have three dual beam fibs, so that's not a problem. Um, we did this the first time with gold on sapphire. Why? Because David Clark did some experiments, the best that I could find, uh, that were as isotropic as I could find for the system that I halfway believed the numbers and I thought, okay, I could compare it to those uh, that were published. Um, he used a, a type of a contact angle, dihedral angles and contact angles. So we reached equilibrium. Uh, this is gold, basal plane of sapphire. The interface is flat. It's coplanar with that of the surface, which is the same condition for Young's equation. Uh, and we measured these relative distances. And we can work out the relative interface energy. And in this case, the surface energy of sapphire we measured independently. And the surface energy of gold has been measured by many people. We use the 111 surface facet, which is 1.4 joules per meter squared. And we can get out the absolute interface energy for a specific low index orientation relationship, which is listed here. That low index orientation relationship, by chance, is also the low energy orientation relationship, which exists at equilibrium. This value, of course, is only for that one. It's not for any general orientation that you would happen to find. Question, Frank? No. no. OK. All right. So I didn't start my watch. I don't even know how I'm doing with time, but I'm a little bit more than halfway through. So I hope we're OK. Uh, we went through the easy stuff, and I talked about surface energies uh, well, basically this list. Um, I want to talk about Kahn's critical point wedding transition. Who's read Kahn's paper? OK. Um, it's not an easy paper to read. Not a Kahn's paper. No, <laughs> that's right. So uh, by the way, the best way that I found to uh, go through uh, his paper is to have a PhD student go through the paper and present it. Um, uh, We've done that several times, um, and it, it works very well. What I'm doing here is I'm going to ignore the paper for a moment, and I'll just talk about the essence. I'm not going to kill anybody with equations or anything like that. Uh, and uh, this is actually something that Dominique Chatan and I have done together in a tutorial that we gave uh, at EMA once. Um, and basically what, what Khan said is that there's going to be, there can be a critical temperature upon which you have a transition in the state of wetting, first order tra transition. That means that you're going from a contact angle, which is finite, to a contact angle, which is zero. Okay? That's, zero is wetting. Anything else is partial wetting. And 180 degrees, if you're talking about contact angles, is, is, uh, is uh, non-wetting. Um, so, I'm drawing here a binary phase diagram, A and B. We have a solution of, of blue, a solution of yellow. We have an immiscibility gap because it's a little bit easier to give the example here. And we're going to put ourselves right inside here, off towards the left, at this temperature and at this composition. And if I'm at equilibrium, I'm going to imagine that the uh, blue is solid and the yellow is uh, liquid, although they're going to both be fairly isotropic. And what will I have at equilibrium? I'll have a little drop of yellow in contact with blue. Now, if I move from left to right in this area, OK, I haven't changed temperature. I'm just going to move from left to right. I, can't, I won't change the contact angles, right? The interface energy will not change. All I'm affecting is the relative amount of the two phases. So as I go from left to right, the drop got bigger. That's all I did, OK? No change in interfaces at all. What Kahn said, proved, and experimentally proved, is that if we 
if there is this critical temperature, what will happen is that we cross it, there will be a change, and we'll go from a finite contact angle to a contact angle of zero, a wetting. Now, if we move from the left to the right, and this is important for the difference between adsorption and wetting, which is not the same, uh, if we go from the left to right now, all we're going to get is a thicker film, right? That's, this is wetting, a thicker film. So that's, that's really the Kahn's critical point uh, paper, is that we'll go from a partial state of wetting, some people call this non-wetting, but it's partial, to complete wetting between the systems. Down here, moving left and right, no change in interface energy, okay? Uh, partial wetting, I don't want to call this non-wetting because non-wetting is really adsorption and where's Roger, he's not here, but he would agree with that, okay? I, I have to admit, I don't quite understand this. So normally we read <coughs> a phase diagram, yeah. like this, in terms of phase compositions. Yeah. And the first question is, why do you talk about a critical temperature rather than a critical composition? Because if you go up in temperature, the mutual solubility of these phases changes, and that could be behind this transition. Uh, yes, but it's not. Um, all, all, you're right, I, I skipped over this. There is some angle here, and so the solubility limit is going to change in this example as I go up in temperature, which um, uh, isn't really important for the argument uh, because um, we still have two phases. The, the amount of B in A has changed slightly as I've gone up. But it, it's but your color scheme should probably reflect as you go up there. The yellow must get more bluish, and the blue must get more yellowish. So you change the composition of the substrate. At, the at, at, at this line or anywhere inside of it? Inside of it. Move vertically. Inside of it. Anytime you move vertically. Inside of this area, not here. So yeah, but that's not the reason. Well, actually, nobody knows the reason why there's the transition, OK? Um, but that's, that's, that's a bulk phenomenon. Uh, what, what's happened is that something critical at the interface has changed, something really critical, OK? And it's an interface phenomenon defined between two bulk phases, OK? That's really the essence of this. Now, the practical example, if I, yeah? Just for clarification, you show this example with an instability gap, but is this transition from partial to Wedding theoretically true for any two component system in which there's limited solubility? So if you solubility, um, I, I, I chose this system because I didn't want to argue about solubility. Solubility has nothing to do with wetting. Not important. You're right. Technically, uh, such a transition is, is possible for any system. Okay. It doesn't mean it will happen for every system, but it okay. can. Okay? Any system in which have one phase that's not soluble and another could get this phenomenon. So yeah. So the, the implications uh, for our microstructure, I kind of drew them out here. So we're below, we are in partial wetting for, that was our droplet on our substrate. Uh, now I put them in a grain boundary. So we have par, uh, droplets uh, or isotropic uh, particles sitting in our grain boundary. Here we have a wetting film. Now this, this should uh, uh, light off some red lights because we see wetting films in our material systems all the time. And the transition actually from separate particles to wetting films is really, really important. By the way, uh, the, those films at grain boundaries of silicon nitride are not wetting films, okay? So that's not the same thing. Here it's a, when I say wetting, that means that if I add more of that yellow stuff, it's gonna get thicker. Those particles will deflocculate. That was your PhD. <laughs> okay, I wanna zoom in on this area that bothered you. Um, and I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do this in two stages. And I'll start with uh, Gibbs adsorption uh, isotherm. So everybody knows Gibbs adsorption isotherm? Who does know it? Okay. Um, all right. So I can't do that proof here, but or walk it through. But it's not really complicated. Uh, the essence is is actually pretty much clear. Um, 
Let's go back, before I go into the example, to that uh, example of sapphire that I showed in the beginning. Uh, we made this artificial surface by cutting it in half. And we had that, uh, I think the ad example I gave was just aluminum sticking out in the end. And those atoms were like a mirror. They're unhappy because they only had Arthur next to them. And they really wanted a lot more friends. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, what Gibbs said is that if we were to add a few friends, maybe not exactly like a mirror, but a little bit different here on the surface, he would be at a low energy state. That's Gibbs. He said that atoms will adsorb, segregate, the same word, to the surface if they reduce the surface energy. In other words, the reduction in surface energy is going to be related to the change in chemical potential of the solute in solution uh, associated with the amount, number of atoms per nanometer squared, how many atoms are sitting out here connecting to a mirror. That's Gibbs. Okay. It's a really, really important equation. It's utterly and completely, totally useless. Uh, you can't practically use this isotherm. Uh, this is not, this is also this, we use this word adsorption and segregation at the same time. But there are metallurgists who took Gibbs and changed it slightly and sometimes use segregation to mean something else. And that's enrichment, what we call enrichment. So if we're, I'm not talking about uh, atoms going to the surface because we've gone beyond the solubility limit. I'm talking about atoms going to the surface because their presence redu reduces the surface energy. In solution. In solution, yes. So let's, let's do that um, again at a, a solubility limit of a phase diagram. But now I'm going to redraw the phase diagram and the x-axis I'm putting in the activity of the solute. And the y-axis instead of temperature I'm writing the amount of excess. Okay, so if we slowly increase the activity or the in a simple solution, the amount of solute in solution, and if the presence of these atoms at the surface reduce the surface energy, then I should measure more excess. Okay, and there are two cases here, and I'm going to skip over this for the moment because I don't know how are we doing for time. What time do I have to stop? Well, can you aim at in ten minutes? Yeah, easily. Okay, okay. Um, so. Uh, I'll skip over uh, the divergence here. So one of the th arguments that's been made over the last few years is that, is that there are potential first order transitions, ah, first order transitions like Kahn's critical wedding point theory, but not between two bulk phases, but at a specific interface itself. So I'm not talking about contact angles here. I'm talking about the energy of a s interface as Adsorbate comes to it. And here, instead of this nice gradual black line that I've drawn, there's a discontinuous jump in the amount of adsorbate at the surface. And that must mean a first order transition in the state of that surface. Almost like a phase transformation of the bulk, but of course, this can't be a phase because we're talking about a surface. We wouldn't want to use that word ever. Um, for those who didn't like the thermodynamics, I can do this atomistically, if you allow me to simplify. So let's take two materials, our red material and our blue material, and we'll put them together, boom. Okay, I haven't reached equilibrium, but I've joined them together, and these guys are starting to talk to these guys, and we have these initial chemical bonds, but they're not quite happy because I haven't waited long enough to reach equilibrium. By the way, when I did this, I must have pushed because I have a bit of a fault in the red stuff, but that's not really important for us. If, if I do wait, if I do wait and I reach equilibrium, it's quite possible that the structure at this interface will change. This is called uh, reconstruction, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this two-dimensional symmetry along that interface has changed in order to minimize the interface energy. That's a first order transition by definition. Now I can add some yellow into solution, <coughs> maybe a little bit more in one than the other because they're two different materials. But of course, the, the chemical potential must be the same if I'm at equilibrium. And if the yellow going to the interface reduces the interface energy, then as I reach equilibrium, I will have some excess at this interface. And I can go through with my microscope and measure the number of yellow atoms per nanometer squared. And if I do that, and I know how many yellow atoms are out here, and I know how to change that concentration to activity, I can actually plug this into a real isotherm, adsorption isotherm, and connect the two and pull out the energy. Or I can measure the energy and go the opposite way. 
It's never been done before, but we could do that. If I add more yellow, then I would expect uh, to get more excess. And I can add more, and I would get even more excess. And I've drawn it now with a little bit more, but not on one plane. Because it's probably oversimplistic to imagine that all this excess is sitting at one atomistic plane. Matter of fact, no one ever said that interfaces or grain boundaries are defined on one atomistic plane. Even more than that, we could actually add more. We're still in the within the uh, limits of the solubility limit and have excess arrive and lead to a reconstruction, another reconstruction, the one compared to the before. Now it's associated with the amount of excess being there. And that also is hypothetically possible. Matter of fact, we can go through as many transitions as possible. Uh, only God can decide. What we are not talking about is going beyond the solubility limit. If I hit the solubility limit, then I have to precipitate somewhere. Now here I've, I've done, simply because I, I didn't want to muck up my drawing, I did homogeneous precipitation out in the blue stuff, but this precipitate may have, could form in the red, and of course more likely than anything else, we would have heterogeneous nucleation at the interface itself. But once we're beyond the solubility limit, we must be nucleating new particles another phase somewhere. The adsorption, gives absorption, segregation doesn't talk about that. Segregation is not the blue stuff throwing the yellow out because it doesn't want any more in there, so it has to precipitate. Segregation is the yellow stuff going to the interface because its presence there reduces the interface energy. Okay? What I just showed pictorially is exactly this. Okay? And these jumps or discontinuous transitions uh, are what uh, uh, Roland Cannon and uh, Craig Carter came up with. And these guys who are friends of ours, Roland has died, uh, were doing experiments, wedding experiments, but with alcohol at the time. And they drank way too much of this stuff and came up with this term complexion. And actually Craig, who was learning French at the time, tried to translate from the French and the alcohol didn't help. But in any case, he came up with this idea of calling it a complexion. Why? Because a complexion is kind of like, you know, the surface, my complexion. Here's my surface energy. They should have been sober. They should. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The example is works because uh, I'm getting warm because I'm overdressed and I'm walking around and I'm talking. And now I'm at uh, the equilibrium state that I can be. And I have a complexion which is certainly different than about an hour ago. So this complexion reflects the equilibrium state of this particular surface. That's all the word complexion means, OK? Some people don't like the word complexion. Uh, some, Arthur doesn't like it. Many people don't like it. Um, I think mostly because it's been misused and misinterpreted. Um, the, the equilibrium state of a surface interface, grain boundary is a little bit more complicated, uh, including chemistry and structure is what this means. And maybe we should say that instead of the word complexion. We can also just call it Bob instead of that. Uh, to make it short, I don't really care, as long as you don't call it a phase. These are very analogous to phase transitions, but these are surfaces. These are not bulk phases, so they are not phase transformations. These are not grain boundary phases or surface phases, um, simply because uh, without the adjacent phase, there is no surface, right? So I'm at the end. Uh, I did a little bit of surfaces, the isotropic and anisotropic. And then we looked at Kahn's wedding, critical point wedding transition. And the only reason I did that was to be able to lead into complexions. The difference being that Kahn talks about a first order transition at, uh, between two bulk phases, at, right, leading to a change in the relative interface energies or relative contact angles. And in the, en in the end, I talked about a transition at the interface itself something happening at the interface, uh, which is a discontinuous jump in the properties. Okay? Um, that's actually, I think, uh, really, that really gets me excited. Um, and I'll try to explain that tomorrow and the next day. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Wayne, for this really stimulating presentation. We had some discussion already, but I'm nearly sure that there will be some more questions. So the floor is open. Now, I was unfamiliar with Khan's critical wedding transition, but when you realize, you know, when you get to that top of that miscibility dome, that everything is going to mix, yeah. something has to be changing between, you know, partial wedding and the point where everything just becomes one solution. So I, I'm finding this is the first time I've even heard about the concept, and it seems plausible that mm -hmm. it could happen if there's some chance. By the way, they actually experimentally proved it. It's not only a calculation. It's really amazing work by Khan and simply worthy of an amazing medallion in its own right, in my opinion. You know, it's a huge amount of work in the physics, experimental physics here uh, based on the critical wedding notions. All these experiments of liquid helium on substrates that uh, people do in physics labs uh, really came out of this kind of stuff. Um, it's, not, it's not solubility, though, right? That's the whole reason why I gave that specific example. You're on your admissibility dome. I should have done it that way, you're right. Vertical sides and a flat top. Yeah, and that would have been even simpler. I actually believe this, is, this notion is probably as important as a con hillier equation. Yeah. It has that uh, far-reaching significance yeah. in the field of experimental science. science. But so my, my question is, does this factor into some practical questions of rain boundary engineering or corrosion? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, um, yesterday I was asking questions about uh, some of the growth experiments that you're doing here, uh, whether the thin films that you're putting down are really thin films or adsorbates. So that's a question of whether we're in an adsorbate is a non-wetting condition, and uh, uh, a thin film would then be partial wetting. Um, so that's one example. And then we can go from partial wetting to wetting. So partial wetting uh, would be those uh, droplets that I showed. And continuous wetting along a grain boundary would be a continuous film. The only difference there is that as I add more of the yellow stuff and it's partial wetting, those particles, there may be more of them or they may get larger. But when I, it's a wetting film, that, that thickness uh, will vary. So um, that's an automatic uh, sign that this uh, story of these, uh, now I have to be careful with the word because they've been called so many things. Uh, they were called intergranular films or uh, equilibrium films, although they're rarely done actually at equilibrium. Sometimes they were equilibrium amorphous films and David, actually, David Clark actually called them at one point equilibrium wedding films. And of course they weren't uh, because uh, the whole uh, story there was that as you add more of the yellow, it didn't get thicker. You'd get precipitation somewhere, and those precipitates may grow, but the yellow didn't. So um, they were not wetting. But you can, of course, have wetting, and sometimes that's critical for us. So uh, I guess the immediate practical application there is if you're, I don't know, trying to solder something together, right? So you usually want that third phase, it's usually in the liquid state, to wet. Um, and so that could be really, really important for, for those type of processes. So I tried to do non-wetting, partial wetting, and wetting. So I'm getting back to this conversation of how complexion is not a phase. Yeah. And your diagram of activation energy is a function of, yeah, this, the, that one with the transition. So are the number of first order transitions unique to every interface? So if I have in your simulation, if I have one interface and I have that same interface for every simulation, do those first order transitions happen at the same place? No, there, well, there's no way to predict that ahead of time. The important thing, the only important thing that I think is really important to say is that there are not six of them. <laughs> So yep, yep, I have to give the background. So there was this uh, w oversimplification of the concept of these uh, transitions based on, not on chemical analysis, and they actually didn't even know how much they had in solution, but on the width of uh, the state of a grain boundary measured by stem, which is iffy at best. Um, and 
they, they, there was an attempt by a group, by the way, it was a legitimate attempt to simplify things and make it uh, stomachable or edible, and they tried to simplify this into six states. And they came up with this concept that there are six complexions. Uh, and it pisses me off. <laughs> uh, because people, I've shown results and uh, people have come up. And so is that, interf is that complexion four or five? And I'll say it's number 17. Because there are, there's no limit to them. So there could be many of these uh, first order transitions. But Jennifer, there may be none for a particular system. It depends on the. Uh, that particular interface. So, so for your interface that you simulated, yeah. if you run that simulation a hundred times, do you get the same set of trends? Is it yes. different? Yeah, no. This is it has to be because it's at equilibrium. Okay. So this is this is this is equilibrium state, this is equilibrium state. None of this is kinetics. So it has to be, yes. The complexion is not a phase because the structure It's not bulk. It's not bulk. It's not bulk. And it can't exist without the adjacent bulk being there. It's yeah. It now, uh, there's an argument out there. Um, I mean, it doesn't satisfy the mechanically separable part of the definition of phases, right? Actually, yeah. I never thought about that one. Um, I always, I must admit, I go to the Gibbs phase rule. But then your emission takes the Gibbs phase rule and breaks it apart. And he likes to call these phases. He, he recognizes that they are unique phases associated with the surface only and not with the bulk, but he calls it a surface phase versus a bulk phase. And I don't want to do that because I don't want to confuse the next generation. So I guess if you were to be teaching sophomores the definition of a phase, <laughs> <laughs> you need to provide them with more than just a phase is a unique composite has a unique composition and a unique structure, but that unique structure has to exist on its own and independent of there its surroundings. Yep. Is that the limit is that But that is a normal thermodynamic it, definition that, of that a phase. Is mechanically it has to have it has so to be separated from the rest of the universe. About that to sophomores, we don't comment on that. So I wonder if we forget <laughs> yes, we have to about that there. sort of implied understanding in our def in our definition of a phase when we teach these topics, and maybe that's the confusion between complexion and phase. Is we Look, forget about no, no, this the implied the, the confusion was due to an excessive amount of height. An excessive amount of height. Height. H Y P. It's a certain spice that's often added to. Um, and the notion that somehow, if you understand this, you can do better grain boundary engineering is hype square. <laughs> well, actually, if you understand adsorption, I think we can do better uh, surface and interface engineering. Um, look, uh, as I'll show tomorrow, tomorrow and the next day, um, there are transitions at interfaces many of them in the computer that I have here uh, that are part of the electronics of the system, that uh, an adsorption transition would be expected to com completely change the electrical properties. And I think we can engineer with that. Um, I don't think it's Intel who defines the effective, the final, finite thickness of dielectrics. But it, it's, but it's uh, a totally empirical approach. Because right now it is. Yes. yes. And, and whether it can never be put on an, what, it, what I would call real engineering if from, based on some knowledge, I doubt. OK, so it's a challenge. So uh, what we basically would need to do is an experiment where we would go and measure the interface energy. And now we have a way to do that between two solids as a function of solute activity for a sp uh, and, and look at the interface structure and chemistry for each one. In other words, this up here. It's a, it's a challenge. But if we could plot this out, there are some physics here that we've never really explored. And Langmuir doesn't do it. Langmuir doesn't do it. And, uh, we, I think we all know that uh, surfaces at, at high temperatures, given a chance, will reconstruct. That's just an interface between the solid and some uh, external vapor. And this is just the same sort of uh, reconstruction that occurs at an interface between two phases. It's not mysterious. Absolutely. Okay. It's not mysterious.
experience is maybe a good word to bring this first lecture to close. <laughs> we have one more important thing to do, however, and that comes out of this package. Actually, Wayne, do you need both your hands free for this? Actually, um, I, I really screwed up because uh, I realize now that um, I wanted to expand adsorption a little bit, uh, and I didn't show that. We um, have time tomorrow. I will do it tomorrow. <laughs> and now, we'd like to thank you very much for this excellent first lecture and present this plaque to you in honor of your Van Horn lecture. Thank you very much.